back here meeting together again on Wiradjuri country and as Chrissy introduced us I'd like to also share the respect for the elders of this region and thank you all as well for traveling across Wiradjuri country and from other regions of Australia to be here today. So thank you all for joining us to celebrate the launch of Natalie Fisher's book Gorza. So it's wonderful to have you back as part of this. You've been involved in many of our lives over the last few months yes. now as a leader of the Silk Inroads yes. project and just for the sense of the audience, I know many of you may already know each other from the Silk in Rose project, but could you just wiggle your hand in the air if you're part of the stitches of the Silk in Rose project? Mm -hmm. Look at that. Almost like, more than half of yeah, us, I'd say. Half. Wonderful. Well, this is a talk, I think, today about something which we will all have in common regardless of whether you are in the Silk in Rose project. This is a celebration of Natalie's scholarship and the work which has led to the production of this extraordinary book, Rosa, the likes of which I honestly have never seen before. And as someone who has been working in the field of Islamic arts, design and visual culture for oh, more than 10 years now, since about 2008, when I first began researching in this space and lecturing it in 2012, uh, I have never seen someone attempt a creative practice research project like this. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Natalie, for bringing it to Wagga. And I guess that might bring the opening question, if you may, if I may. What led to this book before it was a book? What was the starting point for it for you? Well, actually, somebody I knew suggested I write a book because I'd been working in this space for quite a long time. For the last 10 years or so, I've been uh, stitching needlepoint inspired by Islamic tiles and, and architectural motifs from my travels remember that when we used to travel and um, <laughs> it was 10 years last year and my friend said to me you know you've got these images on Instagram and social media that come and go they come and go why don't you bring everything together into a book so it was actually not my idea it was his idea and I thought it was a great idea because last year also represented 40 years since I first pick up, picked up a needle and thread and started stitching I thought it was a perfect time also with COVID lockdowns all those things came together and I thought I'm going to try and write a book now. That is just wonderful so the ability to of course visit these sites in person and then collect images which then relate to a much longer standing skill practice which you maintained for as you said close to 40 years now mm -hmm. and in that case then what brought you to the stitching practice to begin with in this case? Well, I know a few of us may have heard this before, but others are new to this, and I think we have a great many stitchers in the room. Yeah. So how we do, do you now start with the silk in rose? How do you begin stitching? Well, how does it come part of your life? When I was 13, my aunt just gave me a birthday present. A little, one of those little, for the, the stitchers in the group, you know those little kids' kits. Mm. It was just a little peacock. Mm. And it was one of those, it was about, you know, 15 centimetres squared. And she thought, I'll just give that to my niece. And I picked it up and I just loved the feeling of pulling that wall through the holes. Mm. And I just kept going. And so that, I, I was hooked, oh. if you excuse the pun, but I was absolutely hooked. Um, and so that was it. And then I just started uh, stitching um, commercially available designs. And then I started designing my own from there. And that combined with my travels led to my recent body of work. Wonderful, wonderful. And I know the way I first encountered your work was, of course, before Gauza existed. And your book is a wonderful record of extraordinary series of experiments and ambitious projects and increasing recognition for this work around the world. But my first encounter with your work was on social media through Instagram. Yeah. Now, uh, when you were making your work, were you thinking of it as being translated to the digital space through the social media, or were they more the finished object on your wall? What were you aiming for when you were making these works? It was the finished work. Mm. I mean, social media came later. Sure. So it was the, it was the finished work. And mm. so, because I've been stitching this well before mm. uh, social media came along, and so mm. it was always about the finished piece on the wall, mm. creating beautiful things. So that was, that's my aim, it's as an artist to create things that I want to have on my wall mm. and things that I'm prepared to live with mm. for the months it takes to make them because the stitches in the room know how labour intensive the process is. So I needed to love something enough to mm. sit with it for eight months or so. That's incredible. And that was the aim. And it reminds me of William Morris's adage, the famous principle that have nothing in your home that you do not believe to be useful and beautiful. Yeah. So, yes. yes. And in your case, of course, the usefulness is in many ways you're recognising what your travels gave you and then creating something lasting from it. Do you see your work, therefore, as a kind of souvenir or something else? What I like to do when I stitch um, pieces that are inspired by Islamic architecture mm. is 
learn as much as I can about mm. the culture and the visual, the history and the visual culture of the places I've been to. Mm. So it's a souvenir in the sense that it's a keepsake, but it's mm. also a way for me to connect with cultures that aren't my own. Mm -hmm. and, and by sitting with something for so long and painstakingly creating it in a stitch form mm -hmm. allows me to do that. Mm -hmm. um, as you would know, because you, you're, you're involved in Egyptian tent-making stitching in mm -hmm. uh, Kaimia, it's called, isn't it? Absolutely, yes, yeah. that's, that's right. I work with a group of men primarily in Egypt known as the tent-makers of Cairo, and their art form is, as you say, Kaimia, which is the adaptation of the word for tent in Arabic, Kayam, like your gosa for stitch, they know this very well, they do thousands of them every day. Uh, but the making of the tents results in a complex applique technique which resembles quilt making, as we might see it today. Mm. And I'm sure as many people here experience the art of applique as well. Uh, you might be familiar with drawing your works, then perhaps making a template, which uh, is then the basis for the applique itself. What the tent makers do is work freehand. They work with a very loose drawing and everything from there is simply folding it to the right shape. Mm. It's very large, ambitious and very fast. And it would take me more than 10 years to learn to stitch as quickly as they do. Well, you were involved in Silk Inroads as well in mm. this project. And that was the first time you'd attempted this sort of stitching, it isn't it? It was, it was. I have to see how exciting that was. <laughs> oh, why you show and tell? Why did you finish your piece set? Because I didn't have enough Zoom meetings. <laughs> That's the reason why. I was sitting in my Zoom meetings as a sub-dean graduate studies, knowing that if ever uh, the cat was on my lap, of course I could not um, do sewing because I needed my hands on the cat. If I was writing emails, I couldn't sew, I was typing. But if I was in a Zoom meeting, often I just had to be listening and talking, and I could stitch during that time. <laughs> so I was able to get about 14 hours of Zoom meetings resulting in this work in progress. Mm -hmm. So that's as far as I went on mine. And I have to therefore congratulate everyone else who was part of Silk yes. Inroads and actually finished their pieces or several of them. Yes. So that was 14 hours of working. And I have to say, Natalie, that through your advice and especially learning from other people in this room and also absent friends, um, I came to appreciate the skills much more deeply. Yeah, so that's I think good. Something about your book, which I think is particularly important, is it shows what is possible in this media and it encourages people to take skills they may already have and do something radically new with them. Yeah, yeah, yes. that's true. And in fact, I, when you asked earlier about what influenced the book, the mm. Silk Inroads project, which is the exhibition next door that we'll, we'll see at the end of this talk, is was happening in parallel to writing the book. So I was writing the book whilst designing that project and they do influence each other mm. because part of the Silk Inroads project was about teaching people how to attempt my style of stitching because there are many of the embroiderers in the room that you, you would attest there are many different ways to approach stitching uh, designs like I do but I've got my favourite approach and the Silk Inroads project was about encouraging others just to give my approach a try and see if you liked it, to have a go and to make something for exhibition. So when I was writing the book, I thought, how would I teach this to others? And that's why I wrote a how-to section in the back of the book because I drew on that in the workshops and that creates the link between the book and the, and the exhibition. And it was actually reading the how-to section that made me feel confident enough to give this a go. Right, Because <laughs> working with 10 mega stitch is quite a different thing. A few stitches in the right place mean you're adhering a large piece of fabric to another piece of fabric and thus you can fill a large area fairly quickly because the stitches are only the uh, gaps in between. But here, each stitch is the artwork yeah. and that makes it a quite different process. Yes, so I you appreciate your in... very clear instructions on that. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah, because you're filling in every single hole here. Mm -hmm. um, unlike embroidery where you've got a piece of canvas and you're, you're embellishing, it's every single hole that's stitched. Mm -hmm. And as you'll see, we've got a wall, a community wall in there full of these stitch tiles. So my aim in the, in the book is mm. to replicate tiles in needlepoint. But then in the Silk Inroads project, we then turned the needlepoint back into stitch tiles by framing them mm. as ceramic tiles. So it was sort of from tiles to needlepoint back to tiles was, mm -hmm. was the aim. And something I particularly like about the choice of media we've chosen here, we could have just as easily made, for example, 
watercolors from tiles and learn how to paint in this manner. But by learning to work with the patina and luster of the cottons, we are actually creating a surface that feels more like the glazed tile, mm. the changes in the light, and is very tactile to work with. It's a very appealing process, I think. Yeah. And maybe I think that's shared by many in the room as well. The, the process feels pleasurable as you're working It's a the very room. tactile process, isn't it? And there are so mm. many, I mean, I was considering using silk, actually. Oh, yes. It was it was very Why expensive. Why did you choose? Oh, it's expensive. Mm. Yeah, it's very, very expensive. Good reason. Good and also reason. not as widely yeah. available because I thought mm. I needed to choose a material that people could then buy to top up their supplies um, mm. easily. And so the cotton that I chose was, was what we use. But most of my works that are illustrated in here are made with wool. Wool, um, okay. Yeah. I uh, stitch pieces then take them back to their walls of inspiration and, um, and like to photograph them there. And people have asked me how I managed to um, present them in front of their walls. My travel buddy was my hand model and she'd stick her hand under these things with wool on top and I'd say, step back, step back, and then higher, higher. And she'd just place it like that, the wall would be there, and it just turned out to be, you know, just a nice way of showing them back. You know, it's almost like introducing a child to a parent, saying, you know, tapestry, here's your wall of inspiration. So that's, that's what I like to do, and I've featured a lot of that in the book. Um, that, so that's it. That is wonderful. And something I saw in the video that really caught my eye too were the workmen who were creating the Zillish tiles in Morocco. Yeah. And that, well, you may have seen it before, they were hammering and chiseling each piece into precise shape. Now, uh, were they aware of your work as well as a craftsperson working in sewing, or were you, uh, what were your thoughts on actually seeing this process being made in front of you? Oh, well? I, so that, that's what really created the link between my work and the tiles. Ah. Like it just consolidated the connection because yes. it's so time consuming. Mm. The chipping of the tiles, the painting of the tiles, um, the configuration into the patterns, and that, that, that um, workman at the uh, Moroccan um, mosque, Minaret, mm. he mm. was just repairing some of the tiles, but he spent all day just chiseling away and it made me realise there was a really strong connection between the labour intensiveness of my stitching mm. and um, and that work as well. Mm. Uh, so no, he was not aware of my work, but I just loved watching how they work and just completely appreciating the original craft mm. that inspired what I do. I think it's wonderful that the original craft inspired the work directly then. You were learning from them. Yeah. And I think from that too, we're seeing now how we're learning in regional Australia and across other parts of Australia, as this process, I gather, will travel to Sydney later, yes. um, that this work has ongoing translation and value. And mm. I think that's just brilliant. Mm. Because on the photographs, we don't necessarily realise what these works are up close. And I think we were all learning more about the complexity of the design itself in the act of really studying them carefully. Yeah. So uh, that brings me to another question then is where to from here? Are there any other places you also want to be working with into the future, for example? Ooh, you mean the Silk Roads uh, from Wagga to somewhere else? Well, or uh, other... in terms of your own practice as an artist, yeah. uh, working with other tile systems or other places? Well, Turkey, Turkish oh, tiles yes. are just gorgeous. Um, Indian tiles, I mean, India is mm. part of the Silk Roads. So, yes. and we do have some Indian designs in the Silk in Roads exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd love to explore that in a bit more depth because mm -hmm. Uzbekistan is uh, the country that I've spent most time in um, that has influenced that exhibition. Mm -hmm. So there are quite a few uh, designs from Samarkand in there, but I would love to further explore Turkish tiles, mm -hmm. Indian tiles, mm -hmm. and maybe work with other communities where there are people from uh, who've settled from those countries in those mm -hmm. communities and create those connections. Most definitely, so, yes. Yeah. Indeed. Something your book does really well is highlight the elements of those crafts in situ, in Uzbekistan, in Abu Dhabi, and in Morocco, of course, which you really have to go there otherwise to see. They're something yes. you would never see put together in the same way. Yes. So your book does that beautifully. In fact, the Abu Dhabi um, mm -hmm. uh, little how-to that's the Abu, the Abu Dhabi example, which is the project in the book, is actually from a carpet. Mm. So this is the largest, apparently it's the largest Persian carpet in the world. It covers a, about you know half a kilometre or something and, mm. and it adorns the, the huge prayer hall in the Grand uh, Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque in Abu Dhabi. And what I've done for this little how-to project is just created a 15 centimetre, a tiny, tiny little sample from this enormous carpet. Um, just showing, and I think what it shows is, well, what it's taught me is, mm. don't be overwhelmed by enormous mm. um, 
surfaces that can be so overwhelming you think how can I possibly work with that there's too much to it just focus on 15 centimeters Indeed. and ignore the rest and study that mm -hmm. and often they repeat patterns anyway and so once you master a small section mm -hmm. then it can be repeated on, on a large scale as well absolutely um, and something I found too was that any extremely complex pattern is only a matter of one stitch at a time. So one little area, one colour, once you run out of thread, you move on to the next one. Yeah. And I find that the more complex the pattern, the more frequently you change threads, but that also gives you little breaks between. It's good yes. for your eyes. Yes. So it certainly helps. Yeah, that's Very right. Good. That's right. Yes, yes. And then you have your extremely ambitious pieces too, like in your, where you have your Shah Zinda piece. Now tell me more about what it's like to have walked into Shah Zinda. I know we oh. have some images in the book which describe it beautifully, but yeah. just give us a sense of what it's like. Yeah, the Shah Zinda was featured at the, in um, the one of the sections of that video. It's where the, the women were walking down the steps past the beautiful, bright turquoise tiles. Mm -hmm. And this is from the Shah Zinda. So the Shah Zinda Avenue is a key uh, site in Samarkand and Uzbekistan, and it's an avenue of tombs. And it's like walking down a cathedral with mm. these enormous walls on either side. And a lot of these tiles have been reconstructed, so they're not the original, I think it's 14th century original construction. Mm. But um, in my view, having been there, because there's sometimes a bit of uh, question or criticism that, you know, these aren't original, so are they authentic? And, and would, why would you want to work with something not authentic or original? There were many locals using this site, going into the mosques, using the space, and just being here and having the walls, because the thing in, in Uzbekistan is you have to remember to look up because to look up means you see all the detail mm -hmm. and walking through the Shah Izinda mm -hmm. was just gorgeous mm -hmm. because it's so intense and it's so detailed and you, but you have to stop and look up and look at the, look at the pattern mm -hmm. and the, the, the intricacy of the tile work. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely beautiful. Wonderful, wonderful. Gorgeous. And of course, all of this begs the question now, or I choose to go to this question, creating a book when you are a first-time author as well in this case. Yeah. You've been working extensively in this craft, you've been travelling and thinking about ambitious new work, but to take the jump to making a book, how do you get started in this process? Yeah. Because I know it can be daunting for those of us maybe in the audience too who actually have been working in exciting areas for a long time but haven't brought it up to a larger audience yet. So how do you start with making a book that celebrates craft? I didn't know where to start. I thought oh, I'd spent there we a go. <laughs> <laughs> Same as us. <laughs> where, and that was the question I asked myself for a very long time. Mm. Where do I start? Mm. And the first question I needed to answer, which I didn't know the answer to for a long time, mm. is do I self-publish or do I find a publisher? Mm. And so I read up about the pros and cons of each of those two options. Mm -hmm. And a first-time author, it's very difficult to find a publisher as a first-time author. Yes. So I thought I'm not even going to... I think I ruled that out fairly early on. I thought that's unlikely to happen. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to do it myself, have full control over the process. Mm -hmm. So I needed to find a book designer. Mm -hmm. That was what I did. And so then not a printer, publisher, but a designer. Excellent. A designer. Okay. So I found a designer who was recommended by someone who's had a lot of professional publications uh, printed. Mm. And they said they love doing books. They said as long as you've got some really beautiful images as a start, that's mm. a good start. And I did. So I sent the images, I started to write the copy, and it was a longer process than I thought it would be, mm. I must admit. It took mm. many months. Mm. But again, COVID lockdown, what else are we gonna do, really? Mm. Um, so it was my COVID project. But it was an enjoyable process, but a very long process because there were many iterations. Um, my, I found an editor as well. So what, what as a self-publisher, for those of you who don't know, some of you may know this, but a self-publisher needs to find all the people that a publisher would have in their own team. So there was the book designer, editor, uh, photographer when I needed supplement photos that I didn't have. Mm -hmm. It was a case of just bringing it all together mm -hmm. over a period of time and getting it done. Yep, and that sounds like creative practice research PhDs, where we aim to have a particular research process and you're following through to see where it goes from there. Yeah. In your case, also you have a clear sense of what it should be like when it's finished and you had a strong starting point but you also use the team that's around you to get to that point. And yeah. I think that's a critical part of any kind of publication work. Even in academic publishing as well, um, I have worked extensively with co-authors and co-editors, and it's certainly the only way I think you can move through these directions. Mm. So mm. wonderful thing to have that Yeah, no, it was good fun. Excellent. In fact, the first um, 
iteration that came out, the first printed version was mm. thinner than I wanted it to be. I thought, no, oh, yeah. so I needed to beef it up. I thought, I've got so many more things I want to put in this. What did you add then? What didn't make the first cut that didn't um, have the Some of my large scale, I also work with giant wool oh, and yes. giant mesh for installation works. And I can see that you're imagining the people on the whole wouldn't want to necessarily use that, but they do look amazing and you can see them in the book. So <laughs> they're definitely very, very cool. I thought they need to go in. Yes. They need to go in and also some images from some exhibitions like the Sharjah Islamic Arts Festival, oh, yes. I put some of those in as well. Because mm. um, it's very hard to know what other, what people want to see, and um, so I just I had enough things to add, and then it mm -hmm. ended up being this this version. That's it. I know the Sharjah Festival is very well regarded internationally as contemporary arts festival. It's up there with the Jamila Prize and the um, Abu Sayed bin Khalifa work as well. <laughs> There's a lot of interesting work going on there at the moment. Yes, they're they great do. patrons of this. Yes, mm -hmm. they are. The Sharjah Islamic Arts Festival. That's uh, Sharjah is close to <coughs> Dubai, it's about half an hour down the road from Dubai mm -hmm. and they run an international, uh, uh, they run many international arts festivals every year but they encourage um, non-Muslim and Muslim artists and artists from all over the world to interpret Islamic art in contemporary ways and innovative ways and so that really uh, appealed to me and it's very competitive. I, mm, I applied many times and didn't get in. That's why I think it's a wonderful thing you got in. It's oh, amazing. Uh, uh, As it was, an Australian too, all the better. Eventually. Mm, mm. I apply for many things and don't get in and then I just keep trying and um, sometimes it works it. and other times it, it just doesn't work. But. What do you have to lose, really? Just, Absolutely. Just I, try. I'm a strong believer as an academic in the idea of an un-CV. Uh, the things you attempted but didn't work. Yeah. And that's oh, actually, that'd be long for me. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's an important part. <laughs> it's like having a collection of UFOs, unfinished yes, objects. As the uh, the un-CV is important because it demonstrates you're applying for things regardless of what's happening with their outset. Because after all, with major things like ARC grants, Australian Research Council, they're worth hundreds of thousands of dollars that last multiple years. And on average, even in a G8 university, it's known for winning them, you have less than an 11% chance of winning one. Mm. So if you put in months of work forward, you definitely still count the application mm. on your CV. Yeah. So in your case, definitely, I think it's absolutely part of the publishing process is yeah. to be ready for those knockbacks and have plan B, C and D in mind too. Yeah, well, I also work as a consultant. When I'm not doing this work, I have another business and that involves writing project proposals to win work. So my whole life has been about <laughs> writing proposals and being knocked back and again and again and again and eventually you get something and then you can run with it. What can you give us then as advice for those who are at that stage of being uh, looking for a publisher for our work and sending in a proposal, what can you say works from your experience? Ooh, being really clear on what you want to achieve, I think, is the mm -hmm. main thing mm -hmm. um, because it's, you know, you can find the people you know, and also having a good support network. Mm. So, so, so the network and the goal. Yes, the goal and the network. So far, so if you're going to be a self-publisher, as I've experienced, you need to find the people to help you create the product you want to create. Mm -hmm. So it's the, you need an editor, you need a designer, you need, well, a pr the printer came with a designer in this case. Yeah. And I also think there's a valuable comment here about the role of libraries in this process, because I know that when I'm looking to pitch books to academic publishers and others, like the Tent Makers of Cairo and my current book, Deconstructing the Myths of Islamic Art, we go into libraries to see where we think the best publishers are. Um, we're handling the books, we're thinking about what they're going to achieve as an output, and what our content is is separate to the actual manifestation. Yes. And truly, your book is beautiful for this because it moves into a space which is accessible, achievable, but also extremely beautiful oh, and very carefully resolved. Thank so you. it's a beautiful book. Well, I, 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 I appreciate those words and you mm. have that experience from having published your own books as well. Mm, mm. And in this space, mm -hmm. like on the Egyptian tent making. Mm. So can you, on that though, how, um, did your knowledge of that help you in your participation in this project? Ah, in this project? I think it may have. Because certainly, uh, for those of you who are along the journey, you'll know that I gave three lectures as part of the Silk Inroads project on aspects of Islamic art and visual culture, the heritage of the Silk Roads, and contemporary art from Central Asia and beyond. So that certainly helped that part. But in terms of developing Gaza, for example, it meant that I was looking at this, thinking about comparable books, like Arthur Milner's Damascus Tiles, published by Brill in 2008. And Damascus Tiles is one of the few books that I truly covet. 
I insisted that my library purchase it because I could not afford it myself. <laughs> and yes, that's something you can do with libraries. They're very generous about that. Um, but basically, the Damascus Tiles book is lavishly illustrated. It considers scholarship of tiles, not unlike what you're studying here. But it also raises problems of provenance that occur when a tile is moved from its original location and sold through the auction markets, appearing in private collections and museums worldwide. Mm -hmm. What you're doing is far more ethical. You are taking on full responsibility to be there taking the photographs, to create your version from this as a new work of art, mm -hmm. and you're then sharing these skills with others who are also learning from each other. Yeah. And when I think about that scholarly basis of the kinds of books I study, I think that's what shows the real innovation of your work that it sits at a point which is both scholarly and accessible. And that's not an easy thing to achieve. Mm. Well, that's good mm. to know. But your, um, for those of you who don't know, yeah, Sam get, delivered three lectures as part of the series and those the, the recordings are available. And it just adds uh, such meaning and depth of understanding for the project. And um, it really helped me consolidate things like cultural appropriation ah, yes. and those sorts of concepts that mm. I've been grappling with because the, I've been, the, these designs are from cultures and places that are not my own, they're not my mm. cultures. And in my mind, I didn't know how they'd be received by people from those cultures. And so the, I, the concept of cultural appropriation has always been in the back of my mind. Is this okay? Is it, can I do this? Is mm. it going to be acceptable? And your lecture on cultural appropriation was, was fantastic in terms mm. of, um, really understanding and appreciating what it is, like what's acceptable and what's mm. not, what's ethical and what's mm. not. Mm. And I've always just appreciated these sources of inspiration mm. and never wanted to do anything that wouldn't be well received. So and I think you've shown carefully that by even taking the work back to those sites, which is a big step in itself, you've shown respect for the sites and the people and you've seen their reactions to it too, which is a good thing to see. Um, for those, oh, actually, what were their reactions like as well? I'm going to come oh. back to the preparation in a moment. But I'm curious about their reactions. Yeah, the, the, people were fascinated. Oh, cool. Because once, I mean, it's a great way to meet locals when you travel is to have oh, a tapestry of a wall that you stand in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and we had lovely conversations about, you know, stitching and uh, because it's part of the culture in these mm. places. People are handy and they do all sorts of things. And, and people thought it was unusual that I'd come from Australia with the tapestry of their wall. And, you know, it was, it, was, it was unusual, but it definitely sparked interest and conversation. And it was, you know, I had lovely chats with people at, at walls. Well, I call that over walls, yes, leaning on a good wall. It's what they're there for. <laughs> Very nice. I think we should have more of these walls around Wagga. And yeah, we've certainly done right. well to bring one into the gallery for now, but I reckon there should be some more permanent structures somewhere. Yeah. Maybe in other materials, but who knows how we'll achieve this one day. I look particularly at the levee walls around the back of Fitzmaurice mm -hmm. Street and think, wouldn't this be interesting for more contemporary art? Yes. So all ideas welcome, it's a very big wall. Ah, but back to the question about cultural appropriation too. Yeah. For those who weren't in the lectures or haven't seen the recordings yet, the short notice I would like to give is that uh, cultural appropriation is a slur as an accusation, but it's also simply a verb. The real concern is cultural misappropriation to use without credit and to use in a manner that exploits. The real relationship here in whether it's appropriation or misappropriation is one of power and quid pro quo. Has the exchange been conducted respectfully? Are both sides benefiting? And therefore both sides should know the exchange is happening. That's the basis of all quid pro quo. At the minimum, you are citing your sources like in a good essay. But at ideal scenarios, you are exchanging something like labor or uh, money, if it can't be otherwise symbolically conducted, or some other form of extensive respect. And that's what's happening here. In the work you're making here, it's your labor and interest which is making new work from those, and you're sharing this with others through the book. With Silk Inroads, we ourselves are making new pieces from our understandings of these spaces and has done with respect for the other spaces and where they come from. Mm. Everything's very carefully cited. Mm. So it's absolutely appropriate, I think, what we're doing here. Yeah, good. So that's good. I'd like to know from those in the audience who are oh, in yes. the project, and also if, if you've got any questions, we mm. could open up for questions. Um, was was your involvement in Silk Inroads, for those of you particularly who've stitched a lot, there are many Embroiderers Guild members here, mm. was it quite different to the way you normally work? Um, or was it something that you felt familiar with and comfortable with? Mm. Um, is my approach different to what you normally do or, or not? Or is it very familiar? 
any would anyone like to contribute or even non guild not necessarily guild members mm. but um because for me this is the only way i work but i'd mm. like to know whether it's considered to be just a standard way of, of stitching new things or not i've never done it before right oh, fabulous and um but i've always been fascinated by the silk road mm. um, it comes from a woman that uh, came in to say um a teacher uh, mm. just for a couple of terms at school when I was about 14 mm -hmm. and she totally inspired us because she was the the uh, wife of a diplomat mm. and she came in and they they've been in Uzbekistan and Afghanistan and since then I've always been fascinated by the silk road so it wasn't in fact the stitching it was the, the that, subject that matter was the silk road mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. but I enjoyed it the, I didn't do all that well, but it turned oh, out right. You did very well, Maureen. <laughs> you did very, very well. Very, very good. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. No, well, thank you for sharing this too. Anyone else? Any other thoughts or uh, questions about the book or about the, the exhibition, the project? Or when, when I finished mine, and I can't say that it was all that fabulous, but mine was from um, a mosque in Afghanistan. It was yeah. a mosque at Wera. Anyway, when I was coming to name it, and I was playing cards as I usually do on a Tuesday, and I was talking about it. And I was going to call it Blue Afghan. And a friend of mine said, why don't you say something about the women? Because wow. when I looked at the mosque, you know, how we Google everything, mm -hmm. most amazing, fabulous looking thing. But it's for men. Mm -hmm. And in Afghanistan now, the women are back to being less than nothing. Mm -hmm. And it, I just thought, okay, that's it. So I ended up calling it Tears of Afghanistan. Which yeah, you called yours Tears of Afghanistan. It was, <laughs> but it just sort of evoked in me something more than just stuff. yes mm. that's yeah, the thing to find out where it came from and, yeah and what it actually looked like yeah mm. yeah and that comes back to my perception that this is more than just stitching it's about learning yes. about cultures yeah. and places yeah. that mm. you wouldn't otherwise have you ever been um unfavorably received when you take back i have not okay. no i have not that's good um yeah. no quite the opposite mm -hmm. um Whenever I've been in a country where I've had the peace, they've said thank you for, you know, showing an interest in our yes. culture and our places. Yes. So it's been very nice. There's been no negative reaction at all. That's, that's great. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Any other questions for the audience too as well? We all hear, you know, the best talks are the ones where the author actually answers the questions you want to know. <laughs> <laughs> so what uh, questions do you have as well? <laughs> Well, oh, please, yes. Audrey. I don't actually have a question, but when I look at all the tiles, I think, wouldn't it be nice to be fabric? Oh, like, like have, more of an applique quilt process or something or, like this? Or, or just turn each one into a great fabric mm. that you can make clothes from. Mm. Mm. Oh, would yes. Nice? That would be fascinating, yeah. I think. But Especially the idea of adapting, for example, the way... Your, you've just given me an idea. May I share it with the audience? Okay. In that case, I was. Oh, there you go. Then. Um, but your comment about making it like something you could wear. I was imagining then the shot is in there where you have those pediments around the entrance door, and the human body almost being the shoulder with a draping jacket, mm -hmm. and that's a shot is into inspired jacket, but completely hand sewn mm -hmm. by its own wearer. Ooh. Couldn't that be amazing? Oh. So yes, future yes. projects, future projects. <laughs> yeah, future wow. projects. Wow, but that's a, that's a great idea, I think. Yes. Yeah, I'd love to see it as fabric. Mm. So like, printed stitching in a so way. So like, each, you know, each tile expanded to become a fabric, you know, mm. with a pattern, mm. and then turn it into a skirt or a dress or a jacket or mm. a shirt. Mm. Yeah. I think that could be very interesting. Mm. I, that's where that comes in exactly. That's yeah. I was trying to think of a way of raising this. Yeah. Uh, the issue that is raised by adapting these into a fabric would have to be uh, something other than literal. A verbatim transfer from the tiles into a printed fabric which is then sold to others could raise problems of that exploitation of one source to the next. What you have to do is find a way of adapting it into something new before it's a printed fabric. And there are ways of doing this. There are ways of, for example, identifying a motif, redrawing it, combining multiple sources into something new, uh, and also respectfully working with the site in some ways. So a verbatim translation to fabric might work if, for example, the funding is going towards supporting that site, its own reconstruction, or an education program in a village nearby that site, which happens in Egypt, in the Haranya village near Ramses Wissawas of our complex. 
So there's ways of making this happen, but it is a space where we have to navigate the exploitation of the original and its heritage versus who is now benefiting from it. What if it were but a print of wonderful. the stitching though? Audrey, are you talking about mm. making a fabric from the image that's already stitched? Or are you talking about the original tile image? I'm, I'm, talk oh, I'm talking about when I look at all those tiles that we've mm. stitched. Yeah. Mm. I think how lovely to expand each one mm. to make a fabric. Mm, mm. that we could use to make shirts mm. or dresses mm. or and of course, there are ways it can be done. As we said, things like Spoonflower online is known for making images into fabrics again. But you'd want to be um, careful in what you're showing too. For example, something we have to carefully avoiding in uh, the Silk and Rose project, something you never would have seen, of course, which would be details of particular words in calligraphy which have particular um, reverence attached to them. So there are calligraphic words. I can read enough Arabic to be, and Persian to be able to understand what they say or check in dictionaries. So we haven't given you any of the sensitive words there to stitch. Um, but if you're making something with the fabric extension, you have to watch out for that, of course, too. Yeah. But that's about right. I'm sure it could be done from there. Another way, too, is to look at museum collections to find these tiles, which have come from different sources, often from buildings that no longer are extant. So that's why they have the tiles in museums now. And then you'd lay as with the museum as the owner of the work, and then you make your fabric from there. So there's different ways it could be done too, to refer to the collections that do exist elsewhere. Mm. Mm. And I'd be interested to see what people, once I give all these pieces back to the original stitchers, because once mm. this exhibition goes to Sydney in June, the exhibition will tour to Sydney in June, then I'll be bringing all of the tiles back and handing them back to the artists. And it'll be interesting to see what everyone does with them. Mm. Mm. That's right. <laughs> you That's can do right. anything with them. We'll have our own distributed Silk Road. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's right. yes the, uh, the, is it the M31 that we're the on M31. here? The M31. The M31, the Silk Road. Over here, please. I've already decided. Oh, what um, are you going to do? Yes, so I got one of the posters which I've already had framed. Oh, lovely. And I do painting as well. And mm. I had planned to look through for some more images and mm. to have... Um, probably a couple in the tapestry and then one or two painted as well and mm. then there'll be a whole wall of all of them. Oh wow. that sounds incredible. Which I thought would be fun. Mm. Wonderful. Oh, wonderful. Fantastic. I don't have a question but I do have a comment oh, about please, how it please. affected me. So I'm from Scandinavia and did a lot of cross stitch when I was very young and that was a very family thing in times of the cold climate. And this was interesting because it was a much more colourful and more freestyle. And I loved the fact that I could think back to those times, my mother now has dementia and can no longer do any of these things, but it was nice to think back to those family times, but with a new outlook that was freestyle, because mm. I do do a lot of art. I really like the fact that we have artistic license. Mm -hmm. The parts that I loved the most was doing the little um, chips in the tiles. Oh, and yes. sort of thing, Not doing it mm. so exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was very hard to do the curves in one mm. particular direction when you're doing the stitches in one direction. One mm. direction was easy, one direction was hard. Yeah. Mm. And unfortunately, I started with the hardest one and went to the easiest one. Well, there we so go. my <laughs> hardest one has far more errors, but I almost love it more for the errors mm. than the one that's quite precise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that gave me a lot of uh, colour mm. and freedom of thought, which I, which I just really enjoyed. And I loved seeing all the different people that came along to this. The fact that this was so community oriented mm -hmm. and so multicultural in a regional area mm -hmm. um, was a great joy for me to see. It really That's was. That's fantastic, Thank Brandy. You. Thank you. Because I remember also you chose your original design you chose one that was quite complicated. I couldn't do it. No, it, it was very hard. And I couldn't help you get started because I thought, oh, it's. I think you've chosen the wrong one, and yes. then we thought, do you pursue that one, and or you just even think I'd finish in time? Yeah, and then I was so quick. The next one was done in seven hours. Yeah. Or something. so it's about it's selecting so the right quick. thing, mm. isn't it? Yeah. Um, so perhaps next time I need to say, this is you, you know, <laughs> these are easier, these are yes. moderate, these are harder. Well, mine had the three-dimensional part that yours had, and oh. I think I could do it now because I've done a lot of the shadows, but to start with that is not possible. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm glad you changed in the end because then you did yes. get the momentum up, didn't you? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Randy. Fabulous. <laughs> Thank this, you. This just addresses back to what we were talking about earlier. Sorry, I'll cut it off. Sure, that's um, right. I was just thinking, you know, there's an opportunity here for fabric printing as well, mm -hmm. for some of these motions. Mm -hmm. Again, obviously, with, with being careful with the appropriation, but, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, when you're looking at materials and things, you could actually 
use some printing. Mm, absolutely. Mm. And there's different methods, uh, like we talked about in the tile making itself. We had the making of the individually fractured pieces, the cut mosaic or the haprangi printed mosaic, where they basically work with the style of mosaic form, but it's actually a print on the tile, which then creates a color glaze. So it might be appropriate to consider that as a way of making the fabric work in other methods. So yeah, I think this could be another baton for someone to run with perhaps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by the printing of the design or of the stitched image. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Parts of it. Parts of it. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yep. Yep. That repetitive thing that's already in the, in the, the work series, that repetitive thing, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And even looking further south along, uh, well, I guess you have the other Central Asian techniques, including ikat and woodblock printing for textiles, which is so important and so vivid and vibrant in its complexities. So we can be looking to these motifs in particular. So it could be a way of working. Good. Yep. Ah, any other thing? We have time for one last comment or question, perhaps, before we move into the exhibition. The exhibition and afternoon tea. Yeah. Or shall we go into the exhibition? Yeah, I think we have yeah, a non exhibition. Yeah, Natalie, good. thank you so much for this yes. conversation today. I've thank really you. appreciated this, and I think we've yes. enjoyed your questions and comments too. Thank you. So, how do we buy the book? Uh, there are copies of the book in the gallery, if uh, in the E three art space in the exhibition. If you're interested in purchasing the book or just looking at it, mm -hmm. uh, it'll be there, and I'll come and be at a table there if you'd like. If you'd like to have a look. And if anyone's not able to buy it on today, or knows someone else who might want a copy for themselves, how would they go about? Um, on my website, which is artweave.com.au, it's available there as well. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. So well, thank, thank you, you so for much hosting. Indeed. Thanks to the library for hosting this event. Indeed. And thank, thank you. you all for coming along and showing interest. It's yeah. lovely to have you here. So thank sure. you very much. Yep. And you're all let's, welcome to join us now for afternoon tea. I don't know if we can use this door or not. Yes, or we can. We can. Right In that case, let's take the close exit. We'll walk around the beautiful sunshine into that room over there. Yes, so straight out and around there. Wonderful.